So today we're going to be talking about digestion and gut health, which is a pretty popular topic, I guess you could say. Um, so I'm a practitioner. Um, uh, she mentioned that I'm a registered dietitian, so don't hold that against me. Um, we have Diana here too, so we're, we got some good RDs uh, in the house. So why this presentation and um, why I wanted to give it here is because in my I have a private practice, and in my practice I primarily see two categories of people. They overlap a lot, but they are folks with gut health issues and um, folks with mental health uh, and substance abuse diagnoses. Those are my kind of areas of focus. And of course, these two things overlap a lot. But specifically, the people who come to me are those who have tried lots and lots of different diets. They've already been to doctors, some of them functional doctors. They've already tried every elimination diet. They're already taking probiotics. They're kind of at the end of, their, end of the line for them. And what I'm seeing over and over is that these elimination diets and kind of store-bought probiotics aren't really doing the trick. Um, not that they aren't effective, not that they can't be helpful for some people. You know, if there's a gut health issue, something like SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or even something like heartburn, indigestion, irritable bowel syndrome, things like that. Um, taking some foods out, especially if there's an allergy or a specific strong reaction, can be helpful. But what I'm seeing over and over again is people are going on elimination diets, you know, something like paleo even, um, and their gut's not getting better, sometimes worse. Um, and so that's why I wanted to ha give this presentation is to show what I see in my practice um, that actually is helping uh, with an ancestral lens for sure. Um, and some alternative kind of suggestions, uh, offerings that I'm using in my practice that I've seen good results with. So kind of the whole idea, if you get nothing else out of this presentation, you're going to get bombarded with information this weekend. If you get nothing else, I want you to kind of remember that what, at least what I'm seeing in my practice, maybe if you're a practitioner, you're seeing something totally different. So come talk to me, is that it, what usually is what's wrong in the diets of the people that I see is not what they need to take out. It's not take this out, take this out. You need to take out sugar or grains or whatever. The big kind of glaring issue that I'm seeing is what's missing. So I really want to shift the paradigm because of what I'm seeing over and over um, from elimination to kind of what I will, will call restoration, regeneration. And that's really what I'm seeing the best results with, both for the healing of the gut and for the, our relationship with food, because a lot of people are going on elimination diet one after another. And not only is their gut not getting any better, but now they're afraid of almost every food and they don't know what to eat. Um, so, you know, kind of the base for this is that they're, you know, we've talked a lot in this year and other years, I'm sure, about evolutionary mismatch. So the way we are living versus how our ancestors lived even 100, 200 years ago, but all the way back to, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago, if not more, um, are not in alignment. And I think a lot of us are probably aware of that. Um, but that mismatch is leading to disruption in the gut. So what we are experiencing now is not the robust kind of microbiome, which is that ecosystem that fills our bodies, not just our guts, our whole insides and outsides, of the beneficial bacteria and other microbes. So that mismatch is the difference between how we are living and how we are, I will use this term loosely, meant to live, designed to live, um, and how we evolved to live. And that's causing you know, health problems all over, whether it's cancer and diabetes, heart disease, all these things, but especially in the gut because of that disruption to the microbiome. So I'm coming from a practitioner point of view. I'm not a researcher. Um, I'm a nerd in a lot of ways, but I don't work in a lab. Um, so this is all kind of going to be practical advice, things that you can do if you're a practitioner with your, the people you're seeing or in your own life if you have some gut stuff going on um, or friends and family, anybody you know. So there, it's a lot of practical things that you can do rather than studies. I'm not putting any uh, citations up here. If you want them, 
come talk to me afterwards and I can send them to you. I certainly have them. But I wanted to come from more of a practitioner practical point of view. So I'm going to kind of talk about the different suggestions and things I want to look at in five main areas. And I will tell you, much like everyone else who's probably talking, this presentation usually it would or could fill 60 to 90 minutes, and I'm cramming it in. Uh, the <laughs> person who gave the cannabis talk referred to it as a fire hose of information, and I kind of feel like this is the same thing. So in the, in the presentation, I won't necessarily hit every single bullet point in depth, but you can um, certainly come talk to me, and I can get the presentation to you. I'm going to do my best to not talk at a million miles an hour. So the first kind of area I want to look at is going to be the diet. This is, of course, the primary um, lens that I'm going to use because I'm a dietitian. but this is certainly not the only thing I'm going to talk about. But this is the one that I want to focus the most attention on, um, and I'm going to loosely use the term rewilding the diet. So a lot of us are coming from an ancestral perspective if we're already here. But I, what I want to talk about is beyond just saying what I don't eat. If you, can, if you can categorize your diet by a list of what you don't eat, then it maybe isn't um, a gut healing diet. It may not be a restorative, regenerative diet. Certainly it could be helpful to take out some of that quote unquote bad stuff, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be necessarily a gut healing diet. So the, the biggest one that I could talk about is going to be those animal foods. Of course, a lot of us know eating meat is so important for the diet, but the foods that specifically are going to be gut healing are going to be the foods that contain collagen. So the skin, the, the cartilage, those weird chewy bits that we always like have been told to put on the side of our plate that my grandpa would always just take off of my plate because <laughs> even that generation of ancestors knew that it was good for them. Um, and the organ meats. So using the lens of what's missing rather than what do I need to take out. Um, I think the addition of foods that contain collagen and using the organ meats, especially the liver, is going to be the number one thing you can do. So the, the foods that contain the collagen have uh, the amino acid glutamine, which is extremely healing to the lining of the gut. Um, it also contains glycine, which is really important as the organ meats contain it as well. It's really important because when we're talking about healing the gut, our biggest enemy is inflammation. And so a lot of the, us who eat a lot of meat because we're on an ancestral type diet or whatever kind of variation of that you're on um, are really high in the amino acid methionine, which in itself is not necessarily bad, although often vilified. Um, but the problem with that is that we're eating lots and lots of the muscle meats, the steaks, the burgers, the all these, you know, the kind of things that are what we think of as meat. But we're not getting enough of those other bits that have the amino acid glycine to balance out that methionine. So with that imbalance, we get a lot of inflammation. Um, so I really recommend lots and lots of bone broth for someone who's on a gut healing protocol. So, you know, if you're in here, maybe you've heard about that before. But if you just followed a, if you're like, well, I follow a paleo diet, that doesn't mean you eat bone broth. You know what I mean? So thinking about actually what is missing, what do I need to add in rather than what I need to take out um, is going to be really important. You, also, the, the liver and other organ meats are going to be essential for not only getting um, the glycine, but also to get vitamin A, which we really need for our immune system and inflammation, zinc and copper, and thinking about these animal foods that we can get that aren't just the muscle meats from the land and the sea, and those seafoods giving us those omega-3 fats for inflammation as well. The other thing that animal foods are going to give us, specifically the animal fats, is arachidonic acid. And this is a saturated fat that we've always been told are bad for us, at least I have. And this only comes from animal fats. So you could be following you know, a Mediterranean diet or something and eating lots and lots of what we think of as healthy fats, avocado, olive oil, nuts, and things like that. But it doesn't mean it'll be high in arachidonic acid. And why this saturated fat is so important for the gut is because it helps lower inflammation, but it pre helps prevent food intolerances. So if you or someone you know, if you know in your practice, is intolerant to a lot of different foods, they can't eat anything, arachidonic acid may be something to look at as something that they could be deficient in. Um, 
especially if that person has uh, other symptoms of arachidonic acid deficiency, like dry skin, eczema, uh, and things like that, a lot of inflammation. But it's only from animal fats. So a gut healing diet is going to be rich in animal fats. It's not just, oh, healthy fats. It's got to come from the animals. Lard, tallow, egg yolks, those kinds of things. Um, and in general, correcting nutritional deficiencies, it kind of sounds obvious, but again, it's the lens of what is missing in my diet. Maybe that's why my gut won't heal. Maybe it's not that I need to take out all legumes. Maybe it's that I don't get enough liver that's so rich in these vitamins and minerals. Um, and ba a basic mix of plant and animal foods, especially for magnesium and potassium, which are so, so important for the gut. And I think a lot of people in this kind of community know the importance of magnesium. Um, but it's gonna be really important to get that mix of animal and plant foods to get those specific nutrients. And then adequate salt. So another thing that a lot of us um, have probably heard that is bad for us. This is just a list of things that you've been told are bad that are actually good. <laughs> um, it, it's important for the hydrochloric acid production. So a lot of folks I see, this is probably, I wish I had, I kept track of this, but the amount of people I see who have heartburn or GERD as a diagnosis, um, is staggering. It's almost everyone, it seems like. And a lot of those people don't get enough salt in their diet. Hydrochloric acid, the, the chloride, um, comes from the chloride and sodium chloride in our table salt. So we need to get adequate salt. So this is going to help prevent not only GERD, but things like um, H. pylori and ulcers and things like that. So for the complete breakdown of our food and uh, prevention of digestive ailments, adequate salt. We've got to get that good salt. Um, I won't be able to probably do all of these um, in a timely manner, but the number one thing I would say from this slide is a proper preparation of all seed foods. If you're familiar at all with the Weston Price Foundation or nourishing traditions, things like that, this is a big one they talk about. And while they're not necessarily eliminating all the foods in the seed food category, um, the, how they're prepared is really important. So this is when I see a lot um, in people who are already doing an elimination diet or are already eating clean, as some might call it. So uh, things like nuts and seeds would be included, but the issue with this is that they're not properly prepared. So the preparation of seed foods, so that's grains, nuts and, and seeds, and legumes and beans, um, includes souring, sprouting, soaking, fermenting in some way to make them more digestible. This removes the lectins and the, phyt the phytates that can be irritating to the gut, um, but it, is, it also unlocks the zinc and magnesium and other nutrients in them that are bound in them because they're a seed and they're kind of going dormant. We can unlock those nutrients that we need as antioxidants um, and for our digestion but also making them less irritating to the gut. So the reason I want to emphasize this is because a lot of um, people who are on maybe not necessarily an elimination diet, but who feel like they're following an ancestral type diet will sometimes include a lot of nuts and seeds, but they're not in their properly prepared form. So they can still be quite irritating to the gut. Um, I know some like uh, autoimmune type diets uh, eliminate some of these, not all of them. Um, but to me, it's how they're prepared that is really the issue. And so if you're eating lots of almond flour and you're like, but I'm following a really healthy diet, those aren't prepared in a way that are healthy for the gut. And this, you know, none of these are, these suggestions are prescriptive necessarily and some don't have to be followed 100%. But if you're looking at your gut health and saying, I'm not sure why it's not getting better, these are some things to look at. Um, looking at the fruit and vegetable intake and seeing if, if there's a lot of raw vegetables. For a lot of people, that's really irritating to the gut. I won't be able to totally get into that, but that's definitely something, if you're like, I eat a ton of vegetables. If you're there, are a lot of raw, for some people, that's really, really irritating. Um, lots of sulfur-rich foods for proper detoxification, so you can make that um, glutathione, eggs, and then, if tolerated, cruciferous veggies and alliums. Lots of good water. I'm not going to be able to get into that. Um, but I will say, and I will talk about a little bit later, water that does not contain chlorine. So next up, I'm going to talk about herbs. I know supplements are really popular in, the, in this kind of community because we know that a lot of times a diet isn't adequate. 
you know, in giving us everything we need. But I really like to look at herbs, especially the bitters. Um, maybe you've heard of digestive bitters. They're not just for cocktails. Um, so I, I want to think about the ancestral perspective as not just what did our ancestors not eat, but how did they also, what did they use to heal? And plant medicine was really important. Um, bitters specifically are the one I'll probably dig into the most here, but um, this one is really important in the current kind of state of our health because it's been bred out of most of the plants and uh, that we eat even on a healthy diet so wild plants uh, or herbs would have contained a lot of bitter compounds such as alkaloids that stimulate digestion all the way down so if you want to nerd out about how bitters affect the digestive system there's a great book called the wild medicine solution by guido masse i might be butchering that um but he gets really into the science and it's super fascinating the main thing I will say is that the bitter taste uh, that we kind of notice from things like black coffee or um, radicchio, things like that, are those receptors are on our tongue, just like the salt and the sweet and all these other the other tastes. But the interesting thing about bitters is that there are receptors for it all the way through the digestive tract. There aren't that for other other tastes. There's not salty receptors all the way through, or there's not sweet receptors. So the, the job of bitters, basically, the taste bitter, is to make things move. It, it stimulates, it, it moves things along. So in the digestive tract, it stimulates the production of stomach acid, of bile movement, of uh, di the kind of natural digestive enzymes that we have. So it moves things through. So if we think of a modern diet ca causing us to kind of have a stagnant digestive system, bitters are really important to add in. It can help with everything from just kind of like general bloating and um, indigestion feeling to nausea um, and constipation and all these kinds of things because it stimulates all these different receptors all the way down, which I think is really cool um, and why I also think it's really important to add it in because the modern diet, even one that is healthy, doesn't have a lot of bitter in it. So you could start by just adding in more bitter foods but I, I also really like to use herbs as more of a, in a therapeutic dose. So something like digestive bitters. I really like this brand. They're, they have nothing to do with me, but um, I just really think they're a good company. Um, and other herbs that maybe uh, are, it would have been traditionally used to aid digestion. So there's like the really, really bitter ones like gentian and angelica, burdock, all that stimulate uh, movement, especially like in the liver, but even just adding in more bitter foods um, like your radicchios and arugulas and things like that. And finding more heirloom and uh, varieties of the fruits and vegetables we already eat if you don't necessarily want to include herbs um, because the, the breeding and kind of domestication of a lot of our foods have bred out the bitter because it's not what people really want, even though it's good for us. It's kind of like discipline. Um, <laughs> And other herbs too, so soothing herbs, especially for somebody who gets a lot of inflammation in the gut and they kind of feel like they're, um, they're uh, how will I put it, their guts get like pissed off a lot. A lot of inflammation, a lot of irritation, some of the more mucilaginous herbs that are soothing, marshmallow root, slippery elm, licorice root are really, really good for this. So um, bitters are a little bit more popular. They're kind of sexy right now, uh, and a lot of people are using them. But the mucilaginous herbs, I think, are also really, really important to look at. And just including other herbs, peppermint, ginger, chamomile, and these things on a regular basis um, is really important and soothing for a lot of people. So there's a food side, but there's also um, the, the herbal kind of medicine side of things too. And not that I don't think betaine hydrochloride or ox bile or probiotics and all these things aren't useful and don't have their place. But I really want us to start thinking of, of herbs as a, an ally in kind of the healing bitters for sure. Take that away with you. <laughs> and then the last section I'll talk about as far as kind of the rewilding the diet and adding in more foods and thinking about what is missing is going to be fermented foods. I'm a nut about fermented foods. This is my life passion. Um, unless there's a really severe reaction to fermented foods, so the SIBO or the, an IBS or something that really just cannot tolerate them, including fermented foods in the diet is absolutely essential. 
before refrigeration, before canning, um, this is how we preserved our foods. So there's kind of, it was maybe born of necessity, it's hard to know, um, but it's definitely the best way to get the most diverse range of probiotics in the diet. So pills can be really helpful in a therapeutic dose, but the the breadth and depth and different types, the diversity of bacteria and other microbes, uh, beneficial yeasts that you would get from a wide variety of fermented foods can't be replicated by a pill. You would have to take so many different kinds of pills and change over, you know, change what kind of pill you're taking every time to get that kind of diversity. So including something fermented in every single meal is my main recommendation for folks who are looking to heal their gut. Mix it up too, so sometimes sauerkraut, sometimes kimchi, kefir, kombucha, all these different kinds of things. Um, and you know, if something doesn't work for you, especially if a lot of vegetables don't work because of the, the irritated gut, try one, uh, ferments that are not vegetable based. So like a kefir or kombucha, or even just like a splash of apple cider vinegar that's unpasteurized and actually fermented. Um, I'm not gonna have too much time, I think, but, um, including lots of soluble fiber for the prebiotics. So there's a lot of talk about probiotics in the microbiome, but we need those prebiotics, which are soluble fibers to feed those good bacteria. So those are gonna come from things like, um, some of these you might not like, <laughs> apples and oats and uh, nuts and legumes and alliums and all those kinds of, of fibrous vegetables and fruits and legumes and things like that. So including those in the diet, whichever ones work for your body is really important because those good bacteria need something to eat. Um, and then some of those being the starchier foods, some of them being cooked and cooled if appropriate because that can increase the resistant starch. So something like a potato or rice, if you cook it and then cool it, it contains resistant starch, which isn't absorbed by the body, but is really um, helpful in making beneficial, in feeding beneficial bacteria lower down in the colon, um, which is a kind of cool chemistry that happens right within your own body. So I'm just gonna touch on this area quickly, hormone balance, um, specifically gonna talk about the thyroid. I'm just gonna touch on it quickly. If you or some, you know, uh, someone in your practice has a lot of digestive disorder kind of issues and it's unresolvable it feels like you can't figure out why the gut's not healing why the SIBO keeps coming back I would look at the thyroid um, uh, hypothyroidism which maybe it's where I live it used to be in Wisconsin it used to be referred to as the goiter belt because of how poor the diets were in iodine and selenium um, so I see a ton of people with hypothyroidism even just kind of low grade I guess you could call it um, but hypothyroidism, inadequate thyroid hormone production, decreases gastric motility, which is how fast food moves through the digestive system. So when that happens, food sits longer than it needs to, and that's when the, the overgrowth is really, really um, able to kind of take place. So if SIBO is kind of chronic and keeps coming back or just doesn't go away with elimination and probiotics, then looking at the thyroid function is really important. Um, a lot of things can cause the thyroid to not function optimally. Chronic dieting is certainly one. Genetics, environment, nutri you know, nutrition, of course, vitamin D deficiency. But there's a lot of reasons, but that's definitely one that's kind of the, the sleeper. It's one to look at. I will briefly just say getting adequate iodine and selenium, even if you don't want to test the thyroid, you could see if bumping up those two nutrients will help for sure getting enough sunshine and vitamin D, but iodine and selenium, tons of animals and plants from the sea. So by that I would say two or three servings of each per week um, to get adequate iodine and selenium. If you live on the coast here, that's probably really easy for you. Um, I'm trying to eat as much seafood as I can while I'm here. Um, but if you live somewhere that's landlocked and a lot of seafood isn't kind of in the culture, isn't readily isn't readily available, then that may be something to focus on. Supplementation may be necessary, um, but really thinking about the thyroid as a source of chronic uh, small, bacteria, uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And if you're trying to take care of your thyroid, getting rid of a lot of endocrine disruptors is important too. So anything made from plastic 
that you put in or on your body or that you use to um, drink out of, anything like that can interfere with the thyroid. But for sure, adequate iodine and selenium have got to be addressed. So stress in the HPA axis. Um, so HPA stands for um, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So this is kind of how our body is handling stress in kind of a nutshell. This is, that's the most basic way to say it. But what I'm seeing a lot is, as I said, the kind of mental health and gut health kind of populations overlapping so much. So I kind of have that in the italics there. What I'm seeing a lot is what I refer to as kind of a triad between uh, trauma, irritable bowel syndrome, and fibromyalgia. And a lot of it has to do with um, what happens when our um, sympathetic nervous system is activated, especially from a trauma. So that can be an acute event or it can be kind of long-term chronic stress from a job we hate or a relationship that is not going well or kind of a generational type trauma, poverty, all of these kinds of things. Because either of uh, either <clears throat> acute or chronic stressors impair digestion because they cause damage to the microbiome, they increase inflammation by releasing inflammatory cytokines, um, we get some immune activation going, and then after a while, irritable bowel syndrome can can occur, as well as the fibromyalgia, which, you know, is inflammation, other, other places in the body causing pain. And I see those three diagnoses in one kind of client or patient, however you'd want to refer to them, all the time. So if they have a trauma history and they come in and maybe they think they're coming in for weight loss or something, but I notice that they have a trauma history um, or other mental health diagnosis, even anxiety or depression, which would be a cr more chronic stressor, I'll ask them about their gut and about their inflammation and pain levels. And they're almost always shocked because they, they're like, how did you know that I would have bad gut health? Be it's because of this, because of the chronic inflammation. And as I mentioned earlier, that's kind of the enemy of the, of the gut. So if we're always in sympathetic, uh, in our sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight, we're not gonna be able to, you can't be in both, you're not gonna be in both at the same time. The parasympathetic is what's conducive to digestion. So that's what we kind of colloquial, colloquially call rest and digest. So that's where um, blood is flowing to the digestive system so it can work optimally. Um, and that's our goal if we're in a gut healing. To me, the, the stress piece is in the HPA axis piece, the nervous system is just as important as diet in a gut healing. Because if we're eating this like beautiful, nourishing um, kind of diet, ancestral diet, but we have chronic stress from emo emotional stress, we're not going to be able to heal because we're just going to keep bombarding it with inflammation. We're going to keep damaging that microbiome. And this is, you know, it keeps making a feedback loop because we know that the gut is where we make so much of our serotonin and other kind of our feel-good chemicals. So if we if we have some sort of stress or trauma, damages the gut, it's gonna keep that, that feedback cycle going. So, you know, to start from like the most small action you can take, I would say before you eat, try to switch your body from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic. Even if you're not on a gut healing protocol, if you just wanna optimize kind of digestion and nutrient absorption, a moment, a deep breath of gratitude before you eat um, is really beneficial because they, they've shown that gratitude kind of switches off anxiety, it, you know, to put it kind of generally. So that takes us for a moment from, from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic. We get into rest and digest by just pausing, slowing down before our meal. Maybe take a little bit of time in nature, take a walk after you eat to keep yourself, uh, you know, out of that activation stage. So if you're just scarfing down your food in front of your computer while you work and then you get right back to work, Maybe you're, you feel like your gut health is fine, but you're certainly not going to have great digestion absorption of those nutrients. So that's like the little thing you could do today. And kind of a, you know, I will use the term ancestral, but even like a couple generations ago, they would say grace before a meal. And you don't have to be religious to follow the science and go, oh, it's gratitude. They were, they were getting into rest and digest. Maybe they didn't know it, or even if you 
currently say grace before a meal. Um, maybe it feels like for some other reason, but it actually has a physical kind of manifestation of that gratitude, which is really, really cool. Um, and I, I will just say that if someone comes in with a chronic illness, especially if it's autoimmune or related to the gut, counseling is usually something I recommend. That's out, you know, talking about uh, trauma and stressors is kind of outside of my scope. Although, if you're a practitioner, you know that people who come into your office will tell you anything, <laughs> um, which is why practitioners should probably have their own counselors as well. If you're empathetic at all, I, I, for sure, if you're a practitioner. You got to offload that kind of energy somewhere for sure. Um, but so a chronic illness, especially related to stress in the gut, autoimmune at all, mental health practitioner, counselor, something so that that is that piece is addressed because you're you're not going to um, eat a perfect diet and get out of those that other piece. And just avoiding physical stress as much as possible too. kind of keeping that blood sugar regular, making sure you're getting enough um, enough sleep, enough food, enough uh, protein, and if you're, you know, training a lot, enough carbs. I'm kind of limiting your physical stressors, and then adding in um, adaptogenic herbs. I'm, I told you already, I'm, I'm a nut about herbs, but adaptogenic herbs to help the body kind of come back into balance and handle stress better. Ashwagandha is my favorite. Um, you may find one that works better for you, but that's my favorite. It's also great for the thyroid. Um, so also important in talking about digestion are movement and mechanics. Um, I guess I would loosely say that we think of digestion as this kind of like chemical reaction. We think of the microbiome and how the food's broken down is more of a, a chemistry reaction, but mechanics are also involved. So if we, the abdomen where most of our digestive organs are is, is, um, is a cavity that is, uh, I guess, pressure is greatly, it's a greatly affected by pressure, sorry. Um, so anything that constricts blood flow in that area is going to make digestion not work as well. Blood and lymph are also involved in the digestive process. So I see, I see esters here. Um, and I know that Alignment and posture, how we breathe, how, if we hold in our abdomen all day, this may be something that just women experience, maybe not. But if you're constantly thinking about sucking in your stomach all the time, your digestion's gonna suffer. If you're wearing Spanx, I can't even talk about Spanx because they're so bad for you, but anything that's going to put pressure on the abdomen or make it so that blood doesn't flow as well, digestion's going to be affected. So even just how you hold your body, if you're sucking in, all these kinds of things. So movement's really, really key. So there's the, the movement that we can think about with our, with, kind of with our core, with our, um, with our abdominal cavity, but as someone else will be talking about later, it also, exercise and physical activity improves the microbiome. So it has a lot of different, uh, a lot of different layers there. Um, and for more on how, how those pressures and how the alignment and posture um, affect the digestion. Um, you should go to Esther's talk later, but also um, Katie Bowman is, has a lot of wonderful stuff on that too, because I won't have much time to talk about it. But the first step in digestion is chewing, and that's all highly mechanical. And so uh, somebody had just talked about this before with chewing more. I think a lot of us are trying to eat this really great diet, a gut healing diet, but we eat really fast and don't chew enough. Ayurvedic medicine, that's kind of one of the oldest uh, paradigms for medicine, says that you should chew your food about 30 times. Does anybody in here chew their food 30 times? Apparently we're supposed to <laughs> for the best digestion um, because not only do you start to break it down so you can absorb it better, we, we kind of ask our stomachs and the rest of our digestive tract to do a lot of what our jaw is supposed to do and our teeth are supposed to do. So adequate chewing can not only reduce that sensation of fullness and bloating, but we absorb the nutrients better as well. And I hope we all go to our next meal and think about how many times we chewed because 
I bet it's not 30. <laughs> but there's also a chemical piece to this too because the um, saliva has some, thank you, has amylase in it, which breaks down starch. So if it's only in the mouth for a little bit, you're not going to get that chemical breakdown as well. I'm not going to be able to talk about all this because I only have five minutes left. But the, the biggest thing I would say from this is when for elimination, the posture matters too. I'm sure everybody's seen squatty potties. They made it famous. They have them at Target and Walmart, so you know it's kind of mainstream now. Um, but you, adopting a, a kind of primal or ancestral posture for elimination is going to be really, really important too. This can relieve the symptoms of constipation, hemorrhoids, these things for a lot of people. Um, my husband made me one from Reclaim Wood for Christmas, so that's how I knew I was going to marry him. <laughs> I was like, keeper, got it. Um, and anything that's excessive sitting in that 90 degree posture. Um, but I also recommend body work if someone has a lot of inflammation, adhesions, kind of tightness uh, in the abdomen, kind of an abdominal massage is a really traditional technique used in like Central and South America. Um, for improving digestive health as, as well as reproductive health too. There's a lot of other organs in the abdomen, right? Um, and just thinking about the, the web of fascia that holds all of our digestive organs in. So if there's adhesions, tightness, misalignment anywhere in there, our digestion's going to suffer. Um, so just kind of all of this to say we want to zoom out. So elimination can help, but continue to zoom out and see are we really just living kind of a modern American life that's just kind of healthified to make us feel good? Or are we really kind of adopting as many ancestral practices as possible? So the last thing I'll talk about, which I'll only have a little bit, would be the xenobiome. So think we think a lot about what we put in our bodies, uh, the microbiome within ourselves, but we're greatly affected, that microbiome is greatly affected by the microbiome, or the biome, I guess I would say, of the world around us. And so, you know, we're putting in a lot of good food. We're maybe taking a probiotic, but we're never having contact with nature that's got, that's kind of got its own beneficial bacteria and yeast that we need to interact with on a very, very regular basis. So eliminating, I would say, the first a big step besides getting out in nature and kind of the contact with soil, the contact with natural water, not chlorinated water that is antimicrobial, Getting out actually in nature, we, you know, a lot of us have probably heard of taking a soil-based organism for the gut, but if we act actually interacting with the soil is what we need to do. And then avoiding things that disrupt the microbiome from the outside world. So getting rid of antibacterial soaps and gels and wipes and all this stuff that we're told we're supposed to use um, that's on the school supply list for most schools now because we just want to keep damaging those kids' guts. Um, and any medications, uh, NSAIDs, and things like that, birth control pills, all these things that disrupt the gut, we've got to get rid of them. So adopting, adopting a really kind of holistic view of the gut and saying this, the microbiome is not just affected by what food I put in it, but the, how I interact with the world around me. Um, but definitely getting rid of anything that says antibacterial and, um, and getting in contact with nature. That's what we've got to do for sure. And one of the, I guess I didn't mention organic food as part of the antimicrobial because the, um, the pesticides and herbicides that are sprayed on our, our foods are really damaging the gut and causing a lot of the food intolerances we see. Um, but nature for sure, we've got to get in touch with the soil if we want to get the good microbiome again. So I think that's it. I talked too fast, but... <laughs>